process that artists can undertake over the period of years to come to such an incredible result. And to speak more about it, I'm going to leave you with our panelists. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. So thank you, Francesca, for the fantastic introduction. And um, well, it's kind of difficult to hold a conversation without audience for an audience, but we are going to try our best to convey the exhibition and actually the work that we have been doing in the in the last years about it. So I would start by by introducing some of the subjects and also some of the elements that are key to the exhibition. And uh, by doing so, probably the first question or the first remark would be that uh, the exhibition has been made possible or the origin of it, the seat of it um, was a residency. I know that you know, now that we couldn't travel and for many artists it has been kind of dramatic, but residency programs and residencies are really key and core elements to artistic production. For the general audience is perhaps some concept that they are not super familiar with, but it is the idea that an artist would reside or be inside a community of other artists and other people for a, for a longer period and then come up with an idea. So it's like the old retreat when people would like take some step aside of their natural environment and go somewhere to kind of learn about others and learn about themselves. Marcus, um, who is the director of TVA Academy, is also a key person in activating Alligator Head Foundation. And they decided that Alligator Head Foundation, which is a, a conservation mm -hmm. project um, related and oriented towards the regeneration of the reef of corals, but also the sea and fishing in the communities of uh, Jamaica. Um, actually, he came to the idea of inviting Claudia, who was part of the exhibition, sorry, of the expedition I did with TVA Academy two years or two years and something ago with Claudia. She was one of the, of the members of the expedition and take her to Jamaica. And it was from that moment that, you know, the work started to come about. So my first question would be actually for Marcus, if you could imagine that something like that would happen or what do you have in mind? What's the motivation of inviting artists to a community that knows about art, but ambition art probably in a completely different mm. manner. So mm. uh, what it is that you think that also the scientific community, community marine biologists are taken from uh, such an uh, interaction? Yeah. Well, Chus, thank you very much for the question, first and foremost, right? Um, I think we need to rewind just a little bit to, to see where the Alligator Head Foundation came from and then why we're hosting these residencies. So the Alligator Head Foundation was actually uh, born out of a number of these exploratory voyages that we have been doing since 10 years now with the Academy, right? Where we um, were inviting artists, scientists, environmental uh, activists, conservationists, legal experts, and so on, later more and more indigenous leadership to come together for a certain amount of time and spend time on a boat, a 39 meter explorer vessel, the Dardanella, um, to really expose ourselves to the ocean, to be together, to become a collective body together, to be with on and in the ocean for an extended amount of time, to sense this together. and. On these journeys, we, um, we've encountered a couple of phenomenal conservation projects. Um, the first one that we really encountered that was really quite rem uh, remarkable and miraculous was with a coral reef specialist from the Dominican Republic called uh, Ruben Torres, who in one of the sandy bays of the island had initiated a coral nursery with the boys from the neighborhood. It was a kind of a, a neighborhood kind of community project that they did to restore the reef and later on, when we were continuing the, the journey, we came to Cabo Pulmon, which is a former fishing community that at some point 25 years ago stopped fishing because they, they realized that the fish stocks were collapsing dramatically and that they might be able to fish for a little bit while longer, but the next generation would have tremendous difficulties and the, um, the next generation would have no chance whatsoever. And so they formed this kind of um, grassroots uh, conservation effort 
um, where they designated a certain part of the ocean as a marine protected area, no fish zone, they, they defended it against uh, the neighboring fishing communities and so on. And, um, and over the years, the sea regenerated tr tr dramatically. It was tremendous to see how the ocean and how life in the ocean bounced back, right? It's one of those miraculous um, places you can go now and it's completely controlled by the former fishing community, now conservation community. So inspired by this, uh, we first started a coral restoration project through a nursery. And then together with the University of the West Indies, we started making the analysis. They collected data. There was a, a marine lab where a number of PhD students, but also the faculty of the University of the West Indies would do the data collection and analysis. And after a year, they came back to us and they said, listen, this is a fantastic or to, uh, uh, place to protect, right? And so we started then with the local fishing community to talk about the designation, the site, how big the site, where the entry and exit points and all of these kind of things. Um, and after that was established, we started working with the local government to really uh, get this turned into law, that this is a no fish zone and no fishing area. To do so then, to manage this site, we created a new foundation, which is the Alligator Head Foundation, which is run locally, with, um, with scientists, with conservationists, but also with um, former members of the fishing community that are now nature wardens or their scientific divers and so on. Um, but to connect that work back to our initial practice, which is TBA 21 Academy and a cultural and contemporary art organization, we decided to host an artist in residency program next to the lab, right? So this is the answer, the long wind winding answer to the first question. Why is this important? Um, I think for there's two reasons, right? A, this is this is quite a restrictive activity towards the community, right? And and um, even though they were involved in the in the designation of the site and the design of the site and the, uh, deciding how big it is and so on, it is quite something to be initially involved in this or be involved from the beginning in this and kind of understand and get the excitement and all of that. But then when reality hits and you still need to go out fishing to earn money, it becomes more and more difficult, right? So the question was at some point, can we through inviting artists also involve the community in the work of the Alligator Head Foundation, but in a completely different manner, right? Where it's not science, a language, that is, um, that is sometimes highly complex and complicated, um, very often difficult to communicate. Um, so can we involve a different language to, uh, to embrace the community and spread this and share this knowledge within the community? And I think um, the, the previous residents, um, uh, Susanna Winterling and Joan Jonas, found a completely different way, but, um, but Claudia invited five people five members of the community that were wood, woodworkers with lots of experience and knowledge around the wood and how to treat the wood, how to work with the wood, um, in, involved them in that work. And, and I think this was, uh, this was absolutely unique for any resident so far, but it was also tremendously informative for the community to see what is actually behind, work, uh, happening behind the walls of the foundation. On the other hand, um, for, the, for the scientists, I think this conversation with artists to, to have this inherent criticality of contemporary art on the one hand, questioning the, um, the I would say, the disciplines, the methodologies, uh, and also the language of, of science, um, but then also having this capacity to ask really profound, maybe sometimes naive sounding questions, but profound questions that are um, challenging the entire system of how to uh, conduct science is really important to be challenged from a different discipline that is not kind of this peer review thing, but from a completely different discipline to be challenged like that in conversation, I think is, um, is really important. Um, and to continue with that before we go and ask something to Claudia, what is a coral nursery? I know that we know, but since perhaps many people do not know, how does it work? Like, what is what makes a coral nursery a coral special nursery. and is a yeah. coral nursery? 
So over, over the past decades, uh, the Jamaican reefs, and especially on the northeast coast of Jamaica, where all oceanic currents hit the island, have uh, shifted from a coral-dominated system to an algae-dominated system. This means, and this has a number of reasons, one is being hurricanes, the other one is being virus, third one is being overfishing and severely overfishing, uh, and, and at a time, at a certain time it was also very fashionable to do dynamite fishing, right? So light up a stick of dynamite, drop it in the water, and just uh, uh, pick up the fish that are slowly floating to the surface, from the surface, and that's your day of fishing, right? So um, the reef was completely devastated. Um, what you can do is um, in, install a coral nursery in the ocean, right? So it's a, it's a relatively simple structure where you anchor two floating buoys that are attached by, by lines to those anchors, right? And the do, buoys, they hold them in place and then you just span lines in between. And off these lines, you hang um, uh, coral seedlings, right? So you go to a healthy coral, you break off a number of uh, uh, branches and you hang them there. And um, the way that coral grow and coral um, multiply, right, is either through sexual reproduction by spawning or by cloning themselves. So if there's no if there's no uh, time for for uh, for spawning, right, or the environment is not uh, is not friendly for spawning, then they just choose to clone them in themselves, and that's how they grow and populate and multiply. But um, you can then fracture these coral parts more over and over and over again, and all of them will grow. And that means that at some point when they're big enough, you can take them and you can plant them and cement them on the reef. And that's where they start taking and that's how you uh, plant out and regenerate corals. The ones that we've been growing in the water are staghorn corals, so they're and elkhorn corals, they're a specific type of coral that kind of builds a certain mesh once they start growing, uh, which is a fantastic kind of breeding ground and, and, uh, and pupping ground for juvenile fish. So it's immediately, it creates some form of habitat, some form of shelter, some form of ecosystem where juvenile fish then have the possibility and the protection to grow. Thank you very much. Claudia, I have a question for you. Since we all know that you are a Swiss artist and Switzerland is a little bit like Madrid, so you are not exactly surrounded by the sea, the first naive question would be, when did you discover the ocean? Like, what was the first encounter that actually made you feel something about it? And second, also, what did you encounter in Jamaica that was different and motivated the work? So I think, um... Yeah, when I when I think about the ocean and the first uh, relationship I had with it was early on during childhood uh, holidays with my families and going out there to swim for hours and hours and hours. And at the time, as a kid, I was not diving yet, with, uh, like scuba diving. So I would try to stop breathing for as long as I could to observe what I what I could and. Um, even though I didn't know that well this uh, environment, because as you said, I'm from the countryside in Switzerland and I spent most of, um, actually all my childhood uh, in the countryside, in the garden, in the forest. I was free to, to roam uh, in this environment. Uh, yeah, even though I didn't know it that well, I, I always was very curious about it. And so when you invited me for the first expedition, it was really mind blowing for me to go in New Zealand because that was the open door finally to, to get to meet scientists, to get more knowledge about it. And um, that was the beginning of implementing ocean more profoundly into my work. But when you went to Jamaica, did you kind of knew what you would wanted out of the environment or did they encounter with an environment that you did not knew before change and challenge your work in certain aspects? I think in Jamaica the first time I went because I went before to organize the residency to find the, the trunk uh, which were fallen trees uh, at the time 
I was just completely, it was mind blowing for me. It was incredible to see this uh, luscious uh, vegetation. The trees are gigantic, the leaves are gigantic. Everything, it feels home somehow. And this was really weird uh, in a way that I felt very close to this nature very, very quickly. So I felt uh, an amazing and really great um, mood and feeling to to be to be there i'm asking also because i think we're talking so much about jamaica and we're talking about this situation not because in any situation one can produce work in any situation one can produce a new idea but in your work the origin of the material and the intelligence what this material absorbs from its own environment is fundamental. I think you have been working with the wood of your own countryside, and now this wood is from another location. So this location somehow is here today. So Jamaica is here in this in this wood. And I think that this is not an obvious reflection for many people because in industrialized societies, we have been trained to avoid the question of the origin of the materials or even the intelligence of the materials because the material is just a tool to produce something it's just a medium but it is really nothing in itself and in your work you kind of restitute the language of the material so the wood is talking is talking about the corals but it's also talking about about the ground and about the experience of the environment the weather the climate change the ocean of of that part so perhaps you can say what is this what did you discover in this wood that is not present in the wood of the many previous sculptures that you did in switzerland for example so you're right, I'm always uh, sourcing the wood myself. Uh, and in the case of the European sculpture, we could call them like that. It's always wood coming from my countryside where I, I work with Lumberjack to, to, find, uh, to find the trunks. And this wood behind us has uh, incredible properties because it's tropical, it's very heavy, it's full of life, it's very dense, it's very hard and so difficult to, to cut. And um, into this whole uh, family, we have different group uh, of, uh, of different species of corals, um, which are defined by the different wood uh, I could find. We have actually also some sponges. The, the yellow uh, guys here are uh, made out of uh, guinep, a wood that is endemic from the island. And we have the almond wood for the fire corals the pillar corals uh, made out of willow, some buttonwood, some dogwoods, and, and, and more. And all the, those structures, all what you can see is what I'm trying to, to reveal through, through my woodwork, through the sculptures, as I am cutting them with the chainsaw. And then uh, with my team, we are sending them down for ages, actually, to polish them until uh, perfection, to erase the, the trace of the hand as well but mostly to, to reveal what's inside, to see the structure, to see the, the life that the tree must have have, and um, to show the time as well. So there is this idea of time through the sculptures as we can see the, the ring. And then you can understand the way it has been growing. And um, I love to reveal that to the, to the public. And I think also this is super important because we were talking about these communities and one of the big um, sequels of uh, negative one of colonization is the fact that communities cannot see time as a longer period but a short time because they need to survive so impoverishment uh, questions of extraction dependency uh, lack of autonomy in the way that they can relate to their own environment made them over centuries feel that time has an incredible shortage that they therefore uh, sometimes we encounter in certain countries that they live next so near nature a less let's say um the sensitivity towards questions that we in the West are we um, putting forward. But it's not because they don't feel it, it's just because they have the time of survival. And the time of survival is different than the time of the time of art and the time of sculpture and the time of, of science. And I think for you, Marcus, I think, do you think that this type of projects when so I was imagining this morning that we could have, you know, the possibility of having the community 
seen and experiencing what you have done. And I think that if they would, they would exactly having a little bit back that sense of, um, of a elongated time, of, of a time that kind of reciprocates with their idea of knowledge and nature in a much productive way mm. than, than the times that they have been, yeah, by violence, submersing. So I, I would like to also to hear what you mm. think, if, if, if this is not only a way of them to encounter mm. artists, but somehow to gain a dimension mm. um, of aesthetic, let's say, aesthetic encounter with, with their own time. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a number of, uh, or there's a number of other aspects to that, right, to the relationship of, of, um, of nature and one of this intergenerational trauma of the Middle Passage to be in a place that you have never chosen to be in, right? You were forced to be there and I, I'm sure this manifests throughout generation in a, in a relationship to a place, right? So that's the one thing. Um, but regarding to the community seeing the work and being able to see the work, um, before the work was shipped, we actually made a presentation and a little exhibition for the Jamaican community and the community of Drapers that is right next to um, the Alligator Head Foundation or where the headquarters of the Alligator Head Foundation is. And it was really nice to see. It was really nice to see um, a lot of people coming out, a lot of people really being interested in the work, wanting to see the work. And, um, and also um, the colleagues that helped with the work, right, to be really um, proud and, and active and, and um, in this presentation. So this was, this was great. I think it is exactly about that, to show um, other possibilities, right, to open up spaces of, of realities that are not immediately and only attached to survival, right? And I think a work like this can be a, a window in this opportunity or in the, into this possibility. Absolutely. I, um, uh, I, Just two links yeah. about what you were saying, because I, I, I like the fact that you were speaking about Switzerland and Jamaica and, you know, suddenly geographically you, you imagine both sides, right? And um, since I brought those, those sculpture here, the idea was to leave something behind as well, and we started to do underwater sculpture park. With the previous shape, I was working with the cactus. The, so right now we have three cacti underwater, and though, from a family of nine, so we are working on the three next. And um, I really like to think always that the, those uh, sculpture, the, the wood shape of the cacti were made out of oak from my countryside in Switzerland. So I kind of did a swap with the cacti going uh, in Jamaica and the coral uh, coming in Europe. And um, they are not out of wood uh, underwater, they were reproduced uh, out of uh, special concrete uh, that, that is uh, strong for the, for the current and ocean, and et cetera. And uh, maybe you want to explain what, uh, how we are taking care of mm. them now? Well, they are, um, they are made from concrete, right? Which we all know is a, is a kind of carbon heavy um, material, but um, it's been chosen because it has a very rough surface. And for corals to be able to regrow and repopulate a place, you need a kind of rough sur surface. It's very hard for them to kind of attach themselves to um, to a, f a flat or, or really a polished surface, right? And so, therefore, um, despite the carbon footprint of the of the cement, we chose this material because it has a number of properties that would actually then enable them for corals to populate them and start growing on them. So, the last batch of corals that we outplanted in uh, in these restoration regeneration efforts, we actually planted on the base. Of, uh, of the cacti. So now the next time when, uh, when Claudia is going to come and uh, visit Jamaica and uh, come diving with us to see the cacti, uh, there will be um, a bush of uh, staghorn coral around them with a whole new commu community of fish living in them. Yeah, and I was also thinking about the fact that you know, in this exhibition, for me, what it reveals after after installing it is something that I couldn't see before. 
And it's so interesting that that's why probably you do exhibitions, because even if you can do renders and you can talk about it and you can put together works in your mind, when the exhibition comes into life, it brings aspects and elements that before I have not appreciated in the same manner. And one of the most important ones for me is, of course, I knew that um, Claudia is taking the coral out of the core of the, of the tree. So it's like saying that inside every element of nature, there is the possibility of a mutual understanding of all other elements. So the elements are not in a separation, as we learn from the modern times and from illustration, but actually they are together. And then you can therefore kind of um, search for that moment of connection and then have a coral out of a, of a tree. But then I also, when I saw the wall painting, I understood the mutuality, not only you said it's, it's coming from a wave, the wave is a scallop shell, so it, it makes that wave of, uh, of a shell that you so often find in some, in some places of the ocean. But then I thought about the waves and the fact that the waves are made of winds and the winds make that form and that form is actually again in the sea. Why is it repeated? And then I was thinking it's exactly that incredible realization that there is a monumental mutuality going on and transfer of information but then it's also a transfer of form so i thought ah it's as if animals are their own art historians because somehow they have a sensitivity for form related to a function that anyhow has also a symbolic value and um, i was kind of discovering that moment of why is everything coming together this morning, no? And I just wonder, how do you feel about, about the relations of all these elements? We have the wall painting, we have the wood and the coral, which are made of different material, but of the same, for the sake of, uh, let's say, of fiction in art. Then you have the digital that is made of artificial material and information, but yet, who believes that because you really see that video and you want to kiss them and embrace them like teddy bears you really want to haptically relate to that digital uh, video and then you have the world painting again with a much more vibrant kind of sensation almost like in an opera at night when the opera finishes and you have this theatrical moment of closure and yet opening so i just i just would like to to see how, how this works in, in your mind, like how do you see it now that you see it, like me? Yeah, it's funny you speak about the renderings because I, I lived with the rendering now for uh, two years, almost. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel somehow I'm in the rendering, but obviously it's way more powerful and there is a whole new dimension, which is the emotion and the joy that produced the, the show to me to, to be in reality inside. And um, I really love to oscillate and to have this back and forth between our world and the digital world and the natural world. And this show is bringing everything uh, at once together. Because in the, in the cube, which, which is a series of four screens that creates this uh, cube-like sculpture, so it's more than a screen, it's really like a, like a sculpture, the representation of the corals are here to come into life. So some are droning, some are floating, some are swimming. They are becoming lava, snow. They are pushed by geysers. So it's all those fantasy I have about the wood sculptures that the digital realm uh, permit to me to, to actually uh, have uh, and, and transform them and, and activate them. And um, I think obviously people will recognize the sculptures into the screens and have also this back and forth between the day room and the night room. And even though we are on the same level, I have the feeling we, we are soaking in the night room as well, which is even lower than where we are here because we are going deeper. We are under the, the ocean, really. And um, yeah, what brings everything together then is uh, obviously this wall painting, um, this morphism, this 360 degrees of colors and line, 
and uh, spikes sometimes when we arrive into this very dramatic uh, end of the the, the pattern. And um, obviously, optically, it's it's very strong, and everything creates one uh, environment, one one world. So I think they live very well together, even though they will have another life later on. The show will be not here for forever, but at the time, that's the way they they live together. But what also brought us together is truth, no? And um, even though you grew up by the sea. And I think I think uh, many of your family are fishermen, right? So yeah, there is this close relationship. And even though I think you've written about octopus, the ocean was never really a topic, uh, I find. And so can you, uh, but now, uh, lately, um, part of the curriculum at the school is art and ocean, right? And, uh, and now this is the second exhibition within seven days that you curate that has the ocean as a topic. Last week, we opened Taloy Havini at, uh, at Ocean Space in Venice, also curated by you. Um, you will curate next year at Ocean Space as well. So can you, can you speak a little bit about um, how you approach the ocean as a space, as a, as a maybe theoretical space when you embarked on this um, position leading the current? And why did you choose to um, invite Claudia onto the first exploratory voyage of the current? Well, I think that I'm a very good case study and hopefully I can help younger generations to understand how sometimes um, education works. So education has been understood in many ways as a way of uh, rejecting some elements of what we are in order to embrace others. And because uh, we wanted to be thinkers and analytic uh, people capable of having a judgment, then nature kind of never fit into that exercise. It seems that if you think through or with nature, you will not be actually neutral enough because then you would not be taking into account what the text in itself um, is saying. So there are elements from the outside could not enter the elements from the inside. This is very, very present in a very traditional way of getting educated in the whole 20th century. The 20th century is, is totally a text-based uh, century uh, for good reasons and I don't reject any of them and yet it's true that it does not help you to understand what are the connections that you establish outside the text that made possible thinking, even if um, you know enter in some contradictions with things that you learn through reading? Not long ago, I've been uh, reading an incredible text saying how scientists has been analyzing how the brain that is shaped, like how reading has been actually helping us to shape the brain, how fast we become thanks to reading. And then they have been actually studying the brain of the reader for the last 60 years. And then I was like for half an hour in the sofa, totally frozen, a little bit scandalized, and then I thought, but is there any study analyzing the brain when the brain does not read and relate to test? And there is not. And then I, I just sent an email to the person that wrote the book thinking, oh, I'm never going to get a reply. The reply came in five minutes. I'm asking that. Is there any study analyzing the millions of those humans that actually establish a relationship with life without text? And what happens to the brain? The brain does uh, learn. The brain does the also fast acknowledge things. And then she said, no, it isn't. Because that's exactly what's so difficult uh, to analyze. What happens when all the parameters are much more open? So all that to say that I grew in a family where I was the first person attending the school. And I am curious about the part that did not attend the school. And I do understand that in order um, to provide a, a further and future education, or let's say pedagogy, so that we would understand what to do. Because for me, education is not only about learning, it's kind of a formation. So to be formed, like the chorals of Claudia, to have a new morphology, it would be really fantastic uh, to take into account things totally outside the text. So that's why I, I came, thanks to you and the invitation of participating in the expeditions much closer to the ocean. It was a complete, a complete horror. I cannot swim. 
my family, I come from fisherman family. They don't swim. None of my father is working in the sea and he cannot swim. Nobody can. You go to Cuba, you go to Jamaica, you go to the Caribbean, you go to all colonies. And the first thing that the colonies did is to prevent you to go in the sea. The sea belonged to those that conquered the sea. And the sea was a territory um, of the empire. So for me, what we are doing now with artists, with scientists, is to take that em empirization of the ocean back to a space of culture, space of art, the space of epistemology. So that's why I think it's so fundamental. And everyone is asking, but are we going to see more of artists working with scientists and working on the ocean? And the answer is yes, but it's not because of we are going to see more of um, uh, multi-dimensional projects, but we hopefully are going to see more of the dimension of let's say the parts of of the experience that do not enter traditional canonical ways coming together with those that are and see what happens so that's why i think that for younger generations and projects like this and what you are doing in the ocean space and dedicating institutions to the ocean is not only a name it's really an incredible commitment towards a completely different method that we need to implement what I call like the path towards a non-binary world. But I, I really hope that we can contribute to it in whatever form. And I think this is a great exercise, I think. And why did you, why, why were you confident that Claudia would be a great participant? Oh, that's a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I was not. No, I was. Mm, mm. Uh, <laughs> no, I encountered. <laughs> I encountered the work of Claudia as it happens um, as a total surprise. I was invited to attend the opening of a, an exhibition in uh, Kunstmuseum in Luzern, mm. and I read the name. I did not knew her, and then it was a friend dragging me. I'm really, really a lazy person. It's very difficult to take me out of certain environments, and this person convinced me. And then I entered the first room and I saw a wallpaper, wood carving, swings, and you know, all of a sudden my brain said, wow. So all, you know, you can have it all. So the idea of a woman artist that wanted it all, it just completely resonated because I've been trying to explain it to students, to people. You know, woman artists, is, it's about intimacy. It's about delicacy. It's about this. No, it's about not wanting to renounce to anything. And therefore, sometimes it sustains itself into the practice in something kind of very delicate. But it's because they wanted the whole planet. So when I went into that first room, I saw like main goal, become friends. Second goal, working with her. So because of that, we became friends. And now we are working with Claudia. <laughs> and I think it's out of an incredible knowledge of um, the DNA of art history. So I will not claim Claudia is all the time talking about art history, because I don't think it's true. Or it's very consciously working with that matter. But it's kind of in the DNA. Like you have seen it, you have experienced it in museums and collections, and then it just, you know, go, let's say, osmotically in without the, like all my students, perhaps even without knowing the names of those that did the works, but still, it just penetrates the texture and the, and the tissue of your organ. So um, if we are talking about coming to the Museum Thyssen, which is a context of um, more canonical masterpieces, painting, old classics, ideas of structuring the perception and experiences of art in, in such a, let's say, Western, classic, beautiful also way. If you, you want to challenge that substance, you need to put something that could coexist with joy with the past and challenge it, let's say, in a bold, friendly manner. And I, I think that this is exactly what Claudia can do because it pushes questions of form, composition, immersion, uh, to moments that it, it goes from classicity yeah. and, and formalism to um, digital and new media uh, tensions and, and environment. So I thought this is really fantastic if we can do that in Madrid. And I thought also in the context of Spain, it's very important, certain proficiency and certain perfection that is very present in her work because this is a country that has been always having some sort of a complex of inferiority 
and adores perfection. Not that we are really working towards it many times, but it's kind of a goal. And there is some sort of admiration when things just kind of fall and, uh, and, and that's just poof, perfect. So, and this is part of what forms our, our um, underground culture. Um, and I think that this is also some element to take into account, the colors, the vibrancy, synergy, rhythm, and dynamics. So, because her work is very dynamic, mm. and we are in a society that wants to be dynamic, wants to really, we are seeing it even in the pandemic. People are, are afraid, people lost so much, and still the main drive is to push towards maintaining social dynamics, no mm. matter what. And um, yeah, I thought that for all these reasons, it would be a perfect match. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so now I have no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and Claudia, maybe for you, because you, you've, you know, you've supported causes many times. You've given work for, for, uh, for auctions that then supported the orangutans and others. Mm -hmm. But this now, especially with the, um, with the corals in the, in the ocean, uh, with cacti in the ocean, you actually have given work to actively contribute to a restorative and a regenerative practice of the reef. Um, how do you feel about that? And, and do you think there's, um, there's a, a new departure for, for you and your practice and your work, the way that you think also about the, the, the objects that you create? Yeah, I like to think somehow the, um, it's possible to do art for a non-human species, you know? And um, so that's the first goal, because it's... Uh, monument for the corals to grow up on and then it's obviously for the community there the alligators head foundation has a bottom glass bottom boat in case you are not swimming or not diving so there is no excuse you cannot see the <laughs> the sculptures and the corals growing uh, on them and then it's a fantastic way to communicate and create awareness because we have beautiful image of the of the sculptures on the water and obviously the symbolic is really strong to have a, a family of cacti and the water the cacti that explore a possible future of uh, our earth very dry and uh, there is a great clash that is created uh, having uh, this shape uh, under the water so yeah, I'm really grateful this is possible because of the foundation and and TBA and uh, and people like you and and scientists uh, around around that as well. And I recall also amazing uh, discussion I I had with uh, scientists. Uh, we have been working uh, together for for the occasion of this show and other project. For example, uh, marine biologist David Graeber, mm -hmm. that is um, a specialist uh, in, in corals. Mm -hmm. So he knows all about marine lives and corals, but now is into sperm whales mm -hmm. and is uh, trying to find a way to decode their language, which I just find so incredible. So it's somehow diving into an alien world because at the moment we, we don't know how, how, I mean, imagine if we could understand what they, are, what they have to say. And we know now they are extremely intelligent. And uh, obviously, it's, it, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak with such a scientist. Mm. Or for example, Colin Ford uh, from Coral Morphologic that uh, also gave us some footage for the entry video um, that explained about the production of the, the wood sculptures and, and the story behind the corals and um, that those footage are so important for the understanding of the show since they so since you understand how it looked like to to see uh, a coral, a bioluminescent or biofluorescent mm -hmm. coral underwater, and uh, I love this link between the entrance of the show and the dark room uh, in the back where uh, I try to recreate this um, this feeling, since obviously most of us cannot see that uh, in real life. Mm. 
Jules, maybe you want to talk briefly about the the uh, video at the entrance because somehow you chose not to have an introductory wall text, but um, you chose a different format. And why did you choose it? And what did you actually make at the end? Yeah, I want to describe that the exhibition, when you enter, you encounter a video. And then, um, yeah, I don't know where to look because of the, that camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you encounter a video. And in this video, uh, we wanted to provide an, exactly because of what were, what was I saying about text, to, to provide an introduction that was not text-based. And then people would just enter into the main exhibition. And this video, um, it's, it's so interesting that after, you know, so many years uh, and working uh, with an artist talking about what are these images, are these documentation of the journey to Jamaica, is this then a witnessing type of video and how can we just say what we want to say without informing through images uh, to the audience. So at the end we came to the conclusion that Claudia would do a selection, a narrative selection in images of going to Jamaica, encountering the people, working with the pieces that I think it's so beautiful that people have an opportunity to see how the pieces are made. I think the making of them, mm. it also reminds about the encounter of, of this human and non-human and, uh, and gives an idea of what we are talking about, mm. but showing really how she reacted in the environment. So at the end, it ended up doing that selection. And then I thought about doing a text, which is you now an hour, like, I don't know how to call it, a fictional text where the chorals are talking about themselves. So the video is just saying or telling about their surprise of meeting Claudia, because we always talk about our surprise in meeting them. But I thought it would be very beautiful if they also tell us about their surprise in meeting Claudia and the fact, imagine how surprising it is for a coral reef to know about an artist that is there to make more corals. So this is just immense. So that's what I did in the first video with, with Claudia. And I think that is very beautiful because in this first video and in the second video, which is a more uh, high end um, digital animation activation of the corals in both, there is something for me absolutely fundamental in life, which is uh, a naive, uh, sweet, beautiful way of giving yourself into experiences without cynicism. So you just want to, to enjoy. And I think that this is a balance um, that, yeah, that's very present in the, in the exhibition. And, it's, uh, and I think Claudia has been uh, so many times telling me about the quotes of cartoons that, that we have seen when we were kids or quotes of pop elements in culture. And uh, for me, the major glory of this exhibition would be that some kids come and tick tock in it and start just using it and relating to it and encounter the exhibition, encounter art, encounter the chorus, encounter the ocean and encounter their own communities inside this kind of environment. And I think um, that would be really great if people just start to, you know, mm. navigate and be immersed in whatever form they consider that it brings them joy and, yeah, an opportunity to reflect on their own lives. Oh. oh, they are saying that we only have five minutes. Good. Then I'm going to say something very useful. Yes. Which is that <laughs> there is a website in this fantastic foundation, TVA21 Academy, and in Museum Thyssen is a link, which is called Stage. And in Stage, they have been producing works by contemporary young artists. And Claudia is going to be part of this commissioning program with a video similar to the one in the entrance. And it's going to be a whole program of uh, Ocean Uni dedicated. And Ocean Uni is a platform that is activated by Daniela Zilman and Marcus Reimann. And uh, it's part of the ocean space. But it's just an opportunity to have seminars online, reflecting online, giving material, and people can download yeah, text and see and, and participate again. So I think now it's really fundamental to say that we really make an effort to do as much as we could to provide those tools to share, because it's going to be difficult for many people to come to Madrid or even imagine it. Yeah. And um, I think that there is so many entrances of the exhibition that you can experience 
even if perhaps you are not in it, but perhaps some friends of you are in it. So that's kind of very important as well, those days. So thank you so much. Well, if you want you. to say some last words, Claudia, Marcus. Well, Did you like Madrid? Yeah, I love Madrid. <laughs> I, I have been staying in the same uh, zone since I arrived, actually. But uh, the food is excellent. People are extremely, extremely nice. And uh, it has been a really a super nice experience to, to be here and uh, to be welcomed so warmly by the museum and, and everyone. And uh, yeah, as, a, as a last word, I'd like to thank everyone. Thank the, the team of the museum, the team of the TBA 21, the TBA 21 Academy, and my studio, and uh, all my assistants that helped on the wood sculptures, the wood cover from Jamaica, the assistant, the, the wall painting team. Everything was really painted by hand. Maybe I just need to to notice that because it, it looks uh, quite perfect, and sometimes we can lose this human uh, touch uh, in the work. And uh, I'd like to thank also the, comp uh, the computer science department of the University of Freiburg in Germany, which, whom I did um, digital animation with, and Egon Elliot, my dear friend and longtime collaborator for uh, composing the, the music for, for the animations. Yeah, the wood many, covers, the yeah. wood covers, many, <laughs> many, uh, the five wood covers in, in Jamaica and the, the team in Jamaica of the Alligator Head Foundation that um, kind of supported you and in, in, in welcomed you in the work. And then I think then to close the circle right, um, and go back to the beginning of this talk to also um, thank and, and mention Francesca thyssen who makes all of this possible and to you know to um who lets us develop these um ways of relating these days ways of meandering searching investigating finding um and um yeah supports this generously challenges wherever she can and uh, to make it a bit bigger a bit uh, more fun a bit more a bit more and um i think to say this work is so full of joy. And what we saw last night here when the curfew fell, um, there was lots of joy. So I think the last thing to say is whoever can, please come see this exhibition, experience the joy that is in this work, but also the, the profound knowledge of looking at the environment and relating to especially the corals that uh, Claudia has become a big, big friend of. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So you. Thank, thank you to all of you for bearing with us. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>